This is for all of you who missed the McGowan T. I wanted to give you just a really quick synopsis of my trip to Oxford as part of the Harris Manchester Summer Institute um, and just briefly explain what the project's like, Oxford University, Harris Manchester, and the research that I compiled there. Now, first of all, Oxford is a populated by about 159,000 people. There's about 38 colleges and around 98 libraries. So it's a place synonymous with critical thinking, the best minds possible. Every time I get a book from Oxford, I know it's going to be solid. But it wasn't always like this. 800 years ago, it was very different at Oxford. It's a little town known for a place where you could ford oxes through a river. It was a place that uh, did not really want the academics around. In fact, this is a letter from the Pope, uh, an 800-year-old letter from the Pope's office, telling the people of Oxford to stop hanging academics, to provide them with reasonable housing, and to feed them every once in a while. Uh, we've come a long way as academicians, and it was just such an honor and a privilege to spend time just pouring myself into researching and being around people who value that. One thing I love about um, our profession as teachers and professors is that every year we get new minds that are just curious and inquisitive and hopeful. And it was very nice to be around professors who are the same way as my students. Um, and, and that we have that here at Bellarmine, but to have it where you're spending time together, you're eating together, you're st working together, you're talking about your research. That was such a, a thrill and an honor to do and something that I really value. And 800 years ago, I can't imagine how those professors would feel if they could see where Oxford is now and what people are doing there now. And so when, when we came here to, to Oxford, we actually, my wife and I flew from Atlanta to Dublin, Ireland. And as we were getting on the plane, Everyone was saying Brexit wasn't going to happen. And when we landed, Brexit happened. And here was a, sh a shot of Cameron just announcing about talking about the Brexit. And we were at a, a little Irish pub uh, in honor of Dr. McGowan. Uh, we, we toasted to him and to his legacy at Bellarmine with a Guinness and uh, just uh, really kind of set in like the impact, of, the global impact that this decision had on the world. Um, and it made me think as I was there, because part of my research was looking at uh, the, the Anglican, early Anglican Church and just thinking about what that separation from the Catholic Church meant to England at the time. Uh, and being here, being there as part of Brexit really made me think of the, the correlation between the two and, and comparing those. Um, and from, from uh, Dublin, we took a, a train, a, a boat to Hollyhead, Wales, and then took a train to Oxford. This is a picture from my room at the Harris Manchester uh, College. We were so well accommodated. Uh, I, I was well and above be and beyond all expectations. Um, what a beautiful room, what a beautiful view. Um, a little bit about the college. It's 250 years old, so it's kind of a baby by Oxford standards, uh, but it was started by the nonconformist people who did not follow the Anglican tradition. Uh, people who did that were not welcomed at the universities, so they formed their own college, and that's where Harris Manchester came from. But now Harris Manchester is part of Oxford University. It's close to the Bodleian Library, close to the Radcliffe Canon, and if you have to do research at Christ Church or any other library, it's not that far to walk, so you can get to places pretty easily. One of the first stereotypes I always heard when I talked about staying in England, they were saying, everyone would say, oh, make sure you bring plenty of granola bars and cliff bars because you're not going to like the food or find a good Indian restaurant. That's your best hope. Well, I, that was not the case for me. I, I found um, the, at least the food at Harris Manchester College to be absolutely phenomenal. I was just well fed and well taken care of. And they were so accommodating to dietary restrictions and needs. Uh, I just couldn't, they just bent over backwards for people. I really appreciated that. So this is a dining hall there. Every, every college has their own dining hall and dorm and library. This is a dining room uh, um, at Harris Manchester. This is where they planned the D-Day invasion. The amount of history in this place is unbelievable. It's only 250 years old, but I say that only. It's, it's still very old for me as an American. But uh, the, everything has a story and, a, and, and every painting and even the silverware and the dishes, they all came from somebody and somewhere and they 
had a they had a story and it was a very very special place uh really you don't want to miss these meals i felt like i was in downton abbey and maybe downton abbey came there and got ideas i don't know but i just felt like i was treated very well by this by this group very welcoming when i came to harris manchester college i wanted to look at early anglican text and see how it might have influenced a later technical communication documents um, and so really quickly I want to give you a, a brief history of technical communication strategies. Here we have the first mass-produced uh, uh, book with movable type, the Gutenberg Bible. Um, you notice here that there are no headings or subheads or, or paragraphs or anything being used. That really what's being uh, What's more important here is the printer. The printer and the and the technology available to the printer is what's really being maximized here. The reader is being left out of the conversation. Now you can read it, but it's going to be hard for you to find a particular passage if you're having a conversation with somebody. It's going to take you a while to find that. This book does not take the reader into account. It's all about the printer. And that changes as we see the evolution of printed documents. Here, this book was printed about uh, 1540, about 100 years afterwards, and you can see some changes are taking place based on what, what we say in technical communication history is Ramus logic is now being influential in the writing of instructions. Here we see the first bullet points that uh, they actually resemble urine jars, so next time you use bullet points, remember to wash your hands. We see here that uh, information is now being broken apart so that everyone can understand it right so it's easy to find things quickly and to remember things this was um, again from Ramus logic but there's a lot more changes that took place very quickly about 10 years later so from 1550 to 1560 there's really no big advancements but in 1560 there's a huge jump lots of things going on and we were wondering and it, like okay, ram the Ramus logic is taking over, but I'm, I was wondering if there was uh, a, a book that was distributed throughout the, the, the country that was uh, popular and looked at by printers and readers um, and, and that uh, may, might have actually shaped technical communication design strategies uh, and pushed the, the Ramus logic way, way, much, way further so that we see that huge jump in 1560. And my idea was maybe it was the Book of Common Prayer. It was first printed in 1549, again in 1552, and in 1558. And with, the, with Queen Elizabeth in 1558, when that book was out, the, the Anglican tradition was pretty much established throughout the continent. So that could have been a huge impetus. But I wanted to look back at the book and, and see, can I, can I document some of those changes? Can I see huge advancements in that book? And that's what I want to look at when I was at the Harris Manchester College. Part of the, the joy of being part of the Summer Institute was just really getting to immerse myself. So eating breakfast and then sitting down with this book that is right in front of me, typing notes as I looked at each page. I mean, what an honor to, to be able to spend that amount of time in that. I really enjoyed that. This book uh, used a lot of really amazing strategies at the time and, and gave me some wonderful ideas for future research projects. Here's an example of what I found. Um, you'll see at the very bottom the word nothing. It's, a, it's called a catchword and this catchword was used uh, in music at the time um, and what, what it's for is when the musician is getting to the end of the line they wanted the, the to know the next note so while they're flipping a page they don't mess up. And so that technology is actually being brought into a, a, a document to help the reader continue reading. Very important strategy. Again, notice things are tabbed in and things are paragraphed. These are not huge advancements, but you're going to see those in the next couple slides. Here we have some amazing technical uh, design strategies being, being used here. We have a clear heading, subhead, and, and we actually have three columns of text. So it helps us to easily see which ones are related. Again, we see the Ramus logic being used with the bracket down the middle. Things are bracketed out to know that these things are associated together. But it, this makes, imagine if this was like the, the uh, Gutenberg Bible. It would have been a solid block of text, but very hard to understand what goes with what. 
but here we have it clearly delineated for the for the viewer very easy to find exactly what you need in a quick in a quick uh, very quickly here we have what could have been the first Excel spreadsheet we have uh, some really advanced techniques being used here we have things that are categorized underneath each other we, th we have things that are lined up so it's very aligned now Tufty today would say that the data ink ratio is a bit skewed there should be the line should be uh, lessened we probably don't need every line or if we have lines they should be gray and in the back but these are modern concerns back then this is just I think a huge advancement uh, of, of how to categorize very complex information so that people can find things quickly the reader is really being acknowledged in this text again we see some really advanced techniques being used a big heading subhead and then notice this there's directions for the reader and the directions for the reader is printed in a smaller font and actually kind of tabbed in a bit do you see how that's delineated from the actual uh, prayer that you would read out loud and then notice there's a there's a passage on the side of Ezekiel so not only is it telling you what to say it's telling you where to go if you really want more information this is something that's very advanced that we use today the, the, the idea of having that information right where you're needed. This is Ramus logic in action. There's a couple things here that I really liked. First, you have uh, the different font size based on if it's instruction or being read. Again, we saw that technique already being used. So this is being used throughout, which is really advanced. Then you have a call and response. So the priest says something, the congregation answers the priest says grant us thy salvation the con the priest says this and so notice that uh, sorry the priests say Lord save the king and then it's here it's crossed out and Queen was written in I thought that was pretty interesting uh, because I'm sure the priest did not want to mess that up and bless the wrong per or save the wrong person but notice how things are tabbed in font smaller so it's very uh, easy to remember what is being said out loud and what is being given to you as instructions and in this last portion, I want you to notice a couple things. First, notice that there's handwritten uh, instructions on the side. Uh, one of the things I'd really like to look at is the effect of those handwritten notations on future printings. Uh, I think this, is, this might be where we get some of those strategies and how they kind of get incorporated in. It's probably like a, a bottom-up, a deucer-toe type action. Uh, the users do something, and then it bubbles up to the printer. That's one idea that I'd like to look at. Uh, the other thing that was kind of fun was just looking at the little hand marks. You see that little hand mark on the right? Uh, those little hand marks were where the priest was uh, very interested in pointing people uh, to certain passages. And they usually involved money or like the payment of the priest or here in this example, the idea that uh, the priest gets to keep the rest of the bread and the wine. Uh, anything that remains, it belongs to the priest. I thought that was that was really interesting so that if the, the congregation got upset that the priest was taking the wine, the priest could open the book, point to it really quickly, and show them, no, no, I'm within my rights here. So researching and, and spending time in the book was only a small portion of this uh, adventure. One was the amazing uh, lectures and just being around some of the best and brightest minds. Here's Alistair McGrath. I looked on Amazon to see how many books he published, and I, I, I think I, I don't know, 7,000. I have no idea. There's so many pages I couldn't figure it out. Very prolific author. And just an amazing time to, to spend time to listen to this man talk about his research of, about C.S. Lewis and Oxford. Um, you're, this is an unbelievable experience to be around such bright and intelligent people. And of course, the, the pub scene is absolutely amazing at, at Oxford. The pubs are, 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 are just, they're, they're old, they have a history. You could go where Oscar Wilde had a beer, you could go where C.S. Lewis or Tolkien had a beer. So after our research, after our dinner, a lot of times uh, we would all get together and go out and have a drink and just kind of uh, talk about what we were finding, what we were seeing, talk about our universities. There's people from all over the world uh, attending the Harris Manchester Summer Institute. Um, so part of that adventure was just getting to know people, hearing their ideas and their thoughts, and getting feedback from them uh, on, on what you're doing.
another thing that I'll really hold dear is the time with Dr. Waller and in giving getting a tour of the uh, of the university. Dr. Waller is the pro vice chancellor of the university and also the principal of Harris Manchester College. He could get us into any building and that was really fun to watch British negotiation strategies when we would get kind of stonewalled and he would just kind of talk to the people and and, and he would get us in every time. It was so fun uh, walking around Oxford with this man and listening to the stories. He has amazing, uh, uh, he knows so much about this universe. You can tell he really has a passion for it. So it was a pleasure and, and an honor to walk around the university with him. So we've come a long way in 800 years as academicians, right? We can spend a week just immersing ourselves in knowledge and not be threatened by death. So it's such a great time. Now this this uh, the institute is an amazing place. It's kind of like a nerd camp in some ways. I mean, we're all just so in our fields. We're all from different backgrounds, different uh, countries, and different uh, different disciplines. But to have us all together, eating together, studying together, having sharing beers together at the end of the night, and amazing dinners, uh, that is something that I'll treasure forever. And now I know if I do get a sabbatical one day, I know that I want to be back at Oxford uh, among this among these amazing people. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. I want to encourage you, if you're in Bellarmine University, to apply for uh, the McGowan Award. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an adventure you'll never forget. And Oxford is now my favorite city, and uh, I just can't wait to return.